Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar introducing the new Benchtop coded aperture Raman spectrometer. My name is Mikey Diekmann, European Tech Support Manager here at Thor Labs, and I will be the moderator today. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Nicola Reusch. Nicola joined Thor Labs in 2016 as a technical support engineer following her PhD in physical chemistry. She later led the German technical sales team and is now the manager of our new spectroscopy sales and solutions team. You're welcome to submit any questions you have using the Q&A tool throughout Nicola's presentation. She'll be answering at the end of the webinar. Now with that, I'll hand it over to Nicola. Thank you very much, Maike, for the kind introduction. I also welcome you all to today's webinar, and I'm excited to introduce you to our newly released Raman spectrometer. So let's first have a look. Let's first have a look at the agenda so that you know what to expect. I will start off with an historical overview on the main development and some milestones of technology that we now use in the coded aperture Raman system. I will then explain some brief basics about Raman spectroscopy, mainly in order to be then able to point out the main differences of our system compared to conventional Raman systems. I will then go into some more details about the coded aperture approach and show you how our coded aperture actually looks like. This will directly lead me to some advantages and applications that we see for this technology. Afterwards, we will have a look into a comparison of the coded aperture approach to conventional confocal Raman systems that you might be familiar with. Afterwards, we will see a video in which I will show you how to use the device, how to position samples, how to perform measurements, calibrations, and how to use the database. Afterwards, we will review the specifications of the Raman device and I will conclude with a short summary. So let's directly jump into the historical overview. We have to go back as far as the second half of the 19th century, in which two mathematicians named Sylvester and Hadamard presented their first works and publications about matrices, so mathematical constructions, with some unique features that are nowadays called Hadamard matrices. They are used, for example, in coding applications or in imaging applications. In 1928, the Raman effect was then first observed, and as I assume some of you know, only two years later, Raman was awarded with the Nobel Prize for his discovery. The Raman community usually benefited from the inventions that were then made in the second half of the 20th century, namely CCD cameras and diet lasers. They are nowadays used commonly in many Raman systems for analytical techniques. After all of those technologies were available, a group mainly at Duke University, and I would like to point out Gem et al. provided some publications, proof of concepts, and also filed some patents. On the right hand side, you can see a scheme out of one of those patents in which you can see a beam path from a light source through some guiding optics and an aperture mask to which I will be referring later on, a grating and a CCD camera for imaging purposes. Connected to those Patents. Also, a first company was founded that commercialized the technology. Later on, Coda Devices was founded and also had licenses for the patents, which enabled them to offer their version of the Raman spectrometer using the coded aperture approach. This is about the time when we also became very interested in the technology. And in 2019, we came to an agreement with CODA, and CODA was acquired by Tholabs. So now we're lucky enough to have some of the former CODA colleagues working at our Munich office. We had in mind to really redesign the whole device. So we did redesign the spectrometer 
hardware, software, and the algorithm using the vertical integration capabilities of ThorLabs. We also wanted to make it available for a broad range of applications for our customer base. Only two years later, in 2021, we then released the first device, a Raman kit, RSB1, to our catalog. On the right hand side, you can see the spectrograph portion of this kit. And if you are familiar with ThorLabs cameras, you can directly see it on the very right hand side. But we wanted to go one step further. And so a couple of weeks ago, we released the benchtop spectrometer, our RASP1 or RASP2, to the catalog. On the right hand side, you can see the housing of the two models. RASP1 does contain one laser and RASP2 does contain two lasers. And I will be mostly referring to this device throughout the webinar. So, as promised, I would now remind, like to remind everyone of some principal basics of Raman spectroscopy in general. So we're speaking about an inelastic two photon scattering process involving virtual states, as you can see it on the right hand side. This process is not the most efficient one. So you typically need a high intense laser for the excitation into the virtual state. And then you observe the scattered Raman photons with different wavelengths that then make up your Raman spectrum. For the detection, you typically want to be as efficient as possible. On the left hand side, you can see a typical Raman setup consisting of a laser that is then focused onto the sample. The scattered Raman photons are collected. You have to get, eliminate the excitation laser wavelength. The photons then enter the spectrograph through a slit. In the spectrograph, the different wavelength components of the spectrum are split up and eventually detected by, for example, a line camera. The slit is a crucial element of the device. It definitely limits the resolution and also is responsible for the right throughput through the system. In the middle of the slide, you can see a comparison. So in the upper part, you have a comparatively small slit leading to a fairly good resolution of your device, but you lose some photons. If you want to increase the light throughput, you have to increase the slit width, as seen in the lower part. This, however, compromises the resolution of your device. And this is exactly where the coded aperture approach picks up. So we now exchange the slit, not with a simple slit, but with a more complex mask. And here is where the Hadamard matrices I mentioned earlier come into play. So the optical filter represents a Hadamard matrix and we name it Hadamard mask. And in the upper part of the box in the middle, you can see a very simple version of it, a second order Hadamard mask. You then have a, a dispersive element and you need, then need a 2D camera to get an image of your spectrum. This is what happens on the hardware layer. You will then also need a software layer as seen in the lower part that helps you to reconstruct your underlying spectrum with the image you took. It becomes even more complex if you do not use a simple second order mask as shown in this example, but the actual 64th order Hadamard mask that we use. This aperture light looks like it is now shown on the right hand side. The black parts are again blocking the light and the white parts are transmissive. The dimensions of this aperture are 2.3 millimeter times 3.2 millimeters. And if you sum up all the white components of this aperture, you can directly understand that the light throughput through the system is massively increased. Especially if you go compare it to a conventionally used slit as directly shown on the right hand side. This slit would lead to a comparable resolution, but you have a la much larger light throughput. Also connected to the small aperture, all the photons that would pass this aperture typically are 
uh, scattered from a very small field of view, as it is shown below. If you now illuminate the whole code of departure instead, you can collect photons from a much larger field of view of roughly 1.5 millimeter, and also the photons that are scattered at larger angles, so the eton D of the device is much larger compared to conventional systems. This directly leads us to some advantages that I will comment on the next slide. So let us first recap the main advantages of Raman spectroscopy in general. So it, typically, you do not need to prepare your sample. It is a non-destructive and non-invasive technology. You can also detect your sample directly through, for example, a polymer blister packaging, like a tablet in packaging, or through glass, for example, a fused silica cuvette. That makes handling really convenient. It is also well suited for samples containing water in contrast to, for example, FTIR spectroscopy. The acquisition time is also comparatively fast. In addition to those advantages, the coded aperture approach now adds the vastly increased light throughput, which also allows us to use a rather inexpensive room temperature CMOS camera I've already shown you that we have a large sampling area and we integrate over this large sampling area, which is beneficial, for example, for inhomogeneous samples. For biological samples, it might also be interesting to use a lower power density, which is possible with the coded departure approach. As main applications, we can think of quantitative analysis of chemical mixtures or identification of illegal or dangerous substances, for example, drugs, quality inspection of pharmaceuticals and plastics, for those I will show you some examples in the video later on, or for example, monitoring of chemical processes at production sites. It is crucial to know how to compare the coded aperture setup to a confocal Raman system you might be familiar with. I'm now showing you some data that we gathered in together with a research group at a Technical University of Dresden in Germany. They had access to a VTEC Alpha 300R and we provided them with a Thorlabs Raman kit, which have a price difference of a factor of around five. On the left hand side, you can see the measurements. Red is the Thorlabs data and black the VTEC data, which are taken by these two devices. And in both cases, it's very easy to identify the sample as polyethylene. And both samples show, both measurements show a good signal to noise ratio. A main difference between those devices is, however, how the samples or how the light is collected or and excited. So on the very right hand side, you can see how a confocal system excites the sample and the volume from which the photons are collected, which is typically very small. For the coded aperture approach, however, the red middle part, the volume, in addition to the field of view I already mentioned is much larger. So you also average or into the depth of your sample. This has to be taken into account when you want to decide whether a particular application would be a good match to the coded aperture approach. So let's now come to the video demonstration that I pre-recorded in which I will show you how to use the device how to position samples, how the software looks and where to find the main features, how to use calibration routines and how to use the library functions. I will now show you how to perform measurements with the newly released Benchtop Coded Aperture Raman system. Even though the system is designed to be a Benchtop device, it is still portable. RASP-1 contains a 785 nanometer laser, whereas RASP-2 does come with a 785 nanometer and a 680 nanometer laser. These lasers are class 4 lasers. 
but the system as a whole does come with an interlock feature in the lid, making the entire system a laser class 1 system. For controlling the device, we provide a new software named Thor Raman. The home screen of the software provides access to the main measurement control screen, a library management and database tool, as well as to the measurement history. The top menu provides access to the settings menu, the adjustment and calibration procedures, and a help screen. In the bottom right corner, the lid status and laser status is depicted respectively. Only if the lid is properly closed, indicated by a green icon, the measurements can be started and the lasers can be activated. Before starting the first measurement, we will use the built-in self-adjustment and calibration routine to check the performance of the device. To do so, we have two options in the top menu, Adjust and Calibrate. If you first set up the instrument, you should use the Adjust function as it is the more extensive procedure. Today, we will directly use the Calibrate function to verify the performance of the device. We will first position the polystyrene calibration chip. After clicking on Calibrate, you need to confirm that you positioned the polystyrene chip on the measurement window. The device now starts a Raman measurement of polystyrene for one or both lasers. As the measurement sample is known in this case, we can check whether the current wavelength set in the system is still valid. The exact wavelength of the laser under the current measurement conditions is important for the correct conversion from measured camera image to Raman spectrum. As second step, an internal neon lamp is measured in order to characterize the performance of the spectrograph. The neon lines are well known and commonly used for calibration purposes. As a result of the calibration, the deviations of the measured polystyrene peak locations and relative intensities to known values are provided. For the neon lamp, the emission spectrum is measured and peak locations as well as peak width are compared to NIST data stored in the software. Only if all data match the specified tolerance, the result of this verification is passed and the instrument is classified to be calibrated. If the calibration had failed, we would have needed to use the adjust function to determine the correct excitation laser wavelength and set it as current value in the system. This might happen if the laser wavelength shifts due to, for example, changes of temperature. Adjustment and calibration measurements are stored in the measurement history to be reviewed later on if necessary. A report can be created and printed or exported any time. Date and time of the last calibration are saved with every new measurement, which makes it easy to track the device status for each measurement in retrospective. We now move on to our first measurement sample. Different types of samples are easily placed on the measurement window by using our sample positioner, which is available as accessory. For liquid samples, a cuvette can easily be positioned. If you have different holder requirements, we would like to encourage you to download the sample holder template from our website and use a 3D printer to customize the holder. We, however, will directly position a tablet in its packaging on the measurement window. 
After closing the lid, we can start the data acquisition in the measurement screen. First, the 785 nanometer laser is activated and the measurement data are recorded. The first measurement is used to optimize the illumination time settings. The time is adjusted according to the strongest signal to fully utilize the dynamic range of the camera sensor and optimize the signal to noise ratio. The measurement is then repeated several times with those optimized settings and the obtained spectra are averaged. Afterwards, the 680 nanometer laser is activated and this procedure is repeated. In this case, we have measured paracetamol and can now analyze the spectrum. By using a left mouse click, we can position a data point. Moving the mouse and pressing CTRL on the keyboard allows us to read out the data at the crosshair. Pressing and dragging with the left mouse button can be used to zoom into a region of interest in the spectrum for further analysis. A right click brings us back to the original view. Let's now have a closer look into the library functions that the software provides. Libraries allow us to automatically identify potential substances in our sample. Under Manage Libraries, we will first review the default Example Raman library that is installed with the software. It contains a range of typical substances for direct identification. For example, some common plastics like polyvinyl chloride or organic compounds like methanol. To check which library is currently used for comparison of measurement data, we need to review the library entered as active library for chemical identification in the measurement settings. The example library, however, cannot be modified. If you would like to create your own library, you first need to go to the software settings menu and enable editing of custom libraries. If several users work with the spectrometer, you might want to disable the library editing feature to prevent accidental editing. After enabling editing, a new submenu is now available and we can choose between different templates. These define which additional information fields, we call them annotations, go with each database element. Some of these fields are defined mandatory and others are optional. The templates are predefined, but if you have different requirements, please reach out to me or our tech support team to discuss customized versions of the templates. We now add a new library and choose a meaningful name. For each library, you can also choose the number of different components that are used for every database fit. The maximum number of components is 4. With click on Save, the new custom library is added. In the Manage Libraries window, we can see that it is still empty. We now add a new sample measurement by clicking on the plus icon and starting the measurement. While we wait for the measurement to be finished, we can already edit the sample name and the description as required fields. We also recommend adding other information about the sample if it is available. The different annotation fields depend on the template we chose when creating the custom library, but you can also add further customized annotations. Once the spectrum is shown, we can decide whether the quality is high enough to be used for our library. We now click on Save and then on Approve to add this entry to the custom library. Without clicking on the Approve button, the entry will not be added, so it is crucial to not forget this step. 
The software automatically checks whether the sample is a unique entry. If the spectrum was similar to an already existing entry, the software would indicate that this might lead to false identifications in the future. We will now move on to our final measurement for today, for which we will use the example library to identify a mixture of components. First, we position the sample of choice on the measurement window and close the lid. If you work with the RASP2, you can also decide whether you would prefer to use both the 785 nanometer and the 618 nanometer laser, or whether you would like to disable the 680 nanometer laser in the spectrometer settings menu. We will use this feature to shorten the measurement time. We again start the data acquisition and wait a couple of seconds for the measurements to be performed. During that time, we can notice the improvement due to the optimizing of settings and afterwards we will see the ratio of matching components for our sample. In this case, we had a mixture of sodium carbonate and sucrose. We can also decide whether we want to show or hide the measured spectrum. The resulting combined database spectrum or the residual spectrum. For reviewing the spectrum later on, we click on Save, which adds the data to our measurement history. This concludes our product demonstration. Okay, so now that we have seen the how to use the device and all its functions, I would like to review the key specifications of the new Raman spectrometer. So the excitation beam diameter of the laser that we use is roughly 2 millimeters. The signal to noise ratio is specified to be 700 to 1 typically and we guarantee a minimum of 300 to 1. The aperture size of the coded aperture is 2.3 millimeter times 3.2 millimeter. The detection range for RASP-1 is 500 to 1800 reciprocal centimeters with the 785 nanometer excitation laser. This provides access to the fingerprint vibrations range. RASP-2 has an additional laser at 680 nanometer, which provides access to 2600 to 3700 reciprocal centimeters, where typically terminal atom vibrations are located. The spectral resolution is specified to be below 9.7 reciprocal centimeters at 500 reciprocal centimeters. So let's now come to a short summary. I've introduced you today to the large sampling area coded aperture Raman spectrometer that we recently released. It is a self-calibrating device as you, as you have just seen in the video. It has a very robust design and easy to use hard and software. The database can be extended according to your application. We offer two different models, RASP-1 containing one laser and RASP-2 containing two lasers. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I look forward to the Q&A session. Thank you, Nicola, for this great presentation. Uh, we do have time for a few questions. Um, we'll start with a few that already came in, uh, but everyone uh, feel free to add more questions. Uh, we will continue to, to take a look at these. So let's see. Um, uh, first question is if uh, you'd consider adding other excitation wavelengths in the future. Yeah, that, that's a good question because it is choosing a wavelength for Raman spectroscopy generally is very crucial. Um, and obviously it always depends on the sample. So we have the capacity and the capability to do so, but it requires not only to exchange the laser and some components in the device, but also to um, yeah, redesign the spectrograph, which is a bit more effort. 
So we can do that, but first we would like to understand which wavelengths are uh, important for which applications so that we can make a good choice of the wavelengths that we might add in the future. So right now we do not have a specific plan, but if you have an application where you think that like the coded aperture approach would be a good match for a specific applications, we are all ears as always. So please reach out um, so that we can discuss your application. Mm -hmm. How did you decide uh, the two wavelengths that we have uh, for the excitation wavelengths? Mm -hmm. Typically, um, you have to find a good compromise between fluorescence on the one hand and on the other hand, the efficiency, like the number of photons that you get in your Raman process. So we decided to go for 785 nanometer because we wanted to make it a good choice for a broad range of applications. We also know that, for example, 532 nanometer might be interesting for a range of samples, um, but we thought that 785 is a good start to end a very good compromise between fluorescence and efficiency. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, um, next question. Is your system suited for integration into a microscope? Mm, yeah, that's a good question that we already got when we released the uh, Raman kit in 2021. So you have to remember, probably I can go back to this slide, to the comparison slide, because that should make it more clear if we have a look at it. So for confocal systems that are mostly used in microscope setups, you typically, yeah, you, you really focus the laser and you also sample from a small spot. That is not the case for the coded aperture approach in which we illuminate the whole aperture. Yeah? So we sample over roughly 1.5 millimeters and we have a, like a, a higher depth within the sample. So that is obviously, if you would integrate it into a microscope, you would lose all the benefits. So that would not really be the best choice in that case. But a very good question and relevant to think about, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, on a similar note, would the technique be compatible with uh, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's also uh, that's a very good question as well. So yes, we have tested SERS to be compatible with our systems. Um, I cannot show you results yet, uh, but we have tested it successfully and we get an enhancement of the signal. So if you have a certain application, we can certainly uh, look into that in, in more detail. Yes. Okay. Um, and then a more on the side of, you know, our services that we'll offer. Are there going to be loans available? Um, are you going to be able to uh, support, you know, measuring customer provided samples using the system? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me first answer the, the first question. So loan devices, yes, we can offer loan devices. Obviously, we would first like to talk about the application to make sure that it makes sense and to provide you with all the information that you need. But yes, we do provide loan devices, both of the kit and the benchtop version of the Raman spectrometer. About the second question, um, whether we can measure customer provided samples, that's a bit more complicated to answer. It's not a straightforward yes or no, because obviously it depends on whether the samples can be shipped, whether they are good to be shipped, whether we can handle them properly in our office. Um, if they are, for example, dangerous or illegal to ship or things like that, or if there's any biological concern, then that would be more difficult. So eventually we will need to discuss what makes more sense, whether the device would, should come to your lab or whether part of your lab should come to um, our office. But we are open for discussions, yeah. Might depend on the location of uh, the lab. As well, that's true, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. That is all that has come in so far. Um, last chance to submit any additional questions. Otherwise, I'd close it out for today. <laughs>
Thank you very much again, Nicola, for the presentation and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, our next webinar will be on July 26, introducing the new Quantum Optics Educational Kit. You can register for this and for future webinars on our website at thorlabs.com slash webinars. Uh, thanks again to everybody for your attendance and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.